Hey, I'm Brandon, the online campus pastor here at Big Valley Grace, and thank you for taking a moment to watch this message. It is the teaching portion from one of our live weekend worship gatherings, and we have those every single weekend here online and in person, and I just want to extend an invitation to you to join us. We're just a local church, local body of believers, and we would love if you would join us uh, on a weekend upcoming here sometime soon. Uh, but as we get headed into this message together, a couple things just want to point you to. One is a connect card. If there's any way that, that we can pray for you, if you want to contact us, that connect card form is just a really great way uh, to let us know that you're joining us. Any next steps you want to take, stuff like that is right on there. Also, if you want to bring in offering, a worshipful gift uh, to King Jesus, you can do that right on our give page on our website or via text. So hope you enjoy the unpacking, the unfolding of the word as we look at it together. Morning. 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 Great to see you. Welcome to Big Valley Grace Community Church here on our Modesto campus. If you're brand new, we're so glad that you're here. We have two campuses, one in Modesto, one in Sirius, and we're glad that you're with us here today. We welcome everyone who's joining us live online as well. Uh, we're continuing in a series through the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to the Gospel of Luke. If you need a Bible, come to the altar room after the gathering. We have Bibles there. They're good Bibles. They're nice Bibles. The church has purchased them so that we can give them to you as a gift. And if you need prayer, also come to the altar room. But we, are, have, we also have bookmarks if you would like to be reading through the Gospel of Luke with the church family as we read through it. You can obtain those in the lobby at the Welcome Center. And you can also receive a text reminder right to your phone with what that reading is for the day. And do we have, there it is, uh, you text Luke to 833-577-1604 and you can get that right to your phone. So the way I'm gonna begin, we're gonna be in Luke chapter eight. I'm gonna read the passage, I'm gonna pray and then we'll get into the teaching together. So this is Luke chapter eight, I'm gonna read verses 22 through 25. One day he, Jesus, got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him? Amen. Father God, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to come together as a church family, to see one another, to use our gifts and service alongside one another, to worship you with one another, to give to you in community with one another. And Lord, now we have opportunity to, to be in your word together. And God, I'm asking, Lord, would you do an incredible work? You are the God of the word. It's your word. And would you do an incredible work in our lives? Would your Holy Spirit be at work that this moment would change us because we've spent time with the Holy God in his Holy Word by the power of his Holy Spirit? And so, Lord, would you please, please be at work in us as individuals and in us collectively as a group of people who have gathered to worship you? And I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said, amen. amen. As we're going through the Gospel of Luke, it's helpful to remember how is this Gospel structured. In Luke chapter 1, it begins in this way. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, 
that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. As we read through this gospel, each passage has been laid out purposefully by Luke, who's writing this gospel, to create an account that is extremely orderly for the purpose that we might have certainty about Jesus. And the passage that we're going to look at today, it is so purposefully placed in the narrative as Luke arranges the events of Jesus' life in the form of a story and a narrative. It is so purposefully placed, leading to an incredible moment in history. We're actually going to look at that next week. But this passage, I believe, is designed for a person to make a Christological decision. In other words, to determine who is Jesus. Who is Jesus? Who is really Jesus? This passage leads, it forces the reader to say, I've got to make a decision about who Jesus is. Now, when Luke was writing this gospel, it would have been many years after the accounts that he was writing about. He wrote it years after the things that were happening that he's writing about. During the time of his writing is a time of extreme persecution for the early church. Extreme suffering to the point of death. People losing their lives because they're following Jesus. And part of what is the blessing for the church, especially at the time of the first readers, the first hearers of this gospel, would have been an incredible encouragement of who Jesus is in the midst of very difficult circumstances. And all these years later, for us as well, whatever circumstances that you are going through, have gone through, are going to go through, I believe that this passage can be a great blessing to you, us together as a church family, because it addresses who Jesus is, and it forces us to make a decision about who is Jesus, especially in light of very difficult circumstances. So this passage, I'll unpack it in this way. Three unexpected ways that God works in our lives. Three unexpected ways that God works in our lives. These are ways that we would not assume God to work. We would not probably choose him to work. It would probably not be our plan if we were lining things out for the Father. But he's not looking at our plan. He's looking at his plan. And the way he works often is very different than what we would think. It's different than how we would approach it. And this passage shows it pretty clearly. In Luke chapter 8, verse 22, we'll begin at the beginning again. It says, one day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So Jesus is giving the very clear instruction, we're heading out. We're heading out. And this is where we're going. We're going across to the other side of the lake. So let's go. He's giving this instruction. It sets the scene on the Sea of Galilee, nestled low in the mountains. And Jesus is giving direction by his word. It's helpful when we look at this account to look at the Gospels of Matthew and Mark also so that we can see how they're integrated of this same account. So as we walk through it, I'm going to be referencing the verses from the other two Gospels so that we can see a full picture of what has been written about this account. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, it says, when he, Jesus, got into the boat, that his disciples followed him. So Jesus is leading the way, his disciples follow him. When we think about disciples, we, all, we often think the 12 disciples. Well, the 12 was not just about disciples. The 12 were 12 apostles. Not all disciples were apostles. The 12 were apostles. But in following Jesus, we're not just the 12. There were many disciples. There were men. There were women. And in this account, we see this boat's probably a pretty good-sized boat because a lot of folks are getting into, into this boat with Jesus. And so the, the disciples, they find themselves in the boat in this situation because they have obeyed the direction that Jesus has given, the command of Jesus, let's go. In Mark chapter 4, verse 36, it says, And leaving the crowd, they took him, Jesus, with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. So in that gospel, we find the detail. It's not just one boat. It's actually multiple boats. So you've got many disciples. You've got multiple boats. As we were in our teaching team meeting this week, Pastor Lonnie shared, he thinks that the boat would have been about 23 feet long by 3 feet wide, and there would have been multiple boats following the direction of Jesus. 
So we continue on in Luke. So in Luke, at the end of chapter 22, it says, so they set out. In other words, they obeyed the command of Jesus. Jesus gives a command, and now they're obeying. In verse 23, it says, as they sailed, he fell asleep. He fell asleep. My third oldest son can fall asleep in the car within five minutes of every car ride. It is amazing how long of a nap he can get from my house to the church and from the church back to our house. It is impressive. When he drives, I always gotta go like this. Hey, are you awake? All right, you need to stay awake, you're behind the wheel. I don't know fully what's going on with Jesus in this moment, but we know if you read the Gospels, you can see the kind of days that Jesus has. His days are full. His days are full of an incredible amount of activity, working with people. But it also shows in us in this moment his humanity. You know, in John chapter 4, verse 6, it has a phrase about Jesus. Wearied as he was. Wearied as he was. Jesus got tired in his body. And it helps us see that. You know, the scripture has a lot to say about sleep. In Psalm 3, 5, it says, I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. In Psalm 4, 8, in peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you, O Lord, for you alone, or O Lord, make me dwell in safety. In Psalm 127, 2, it says, It is in vain that you rise up early and go out late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Sleep's actually a gift from God. And in this moment, I think it's helping us see Jesus is, has humanity. It's also helping us see that he's receiving a gift that God gives, which is a gift of sleep. But I think it also points to he is feeling secure because people sleep when they feel secure. And when people don't feel secure, they can't sleep. And he has security and he lays down in this boat. He's trusting in the Father. In Luke chapter eight, verse 23, it says, and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in danger. So this sea is through the mountains on the edge of Israel and it would form like a wind tunnel down into the sea. And it would hit the water and it would create waves and it would become life-threatening. In Mark's gospel in 437, it says, and a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. Our team did an incredible job this week to gain permission for us to be able to show you some footage of a storm on this very lake. And so check this out. The year 1992. When a famous Israeli director, Moshe Alpert, captures one of the greatest storms ever recorded on tape in the Sea of Galilee. And if we use the same analysis method, we can estimate that the height of the waves to be as high as 10 feet. On smaller boats, waves this high can definitely be considered life-threatening, even for experience. Matthew's Gospel in 824 says, And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. One of the things we considered, again, as we were talking on the, as part of the teaching team this week, is that the storm was probably out of season. The storm very well is a storm by God's design. This was a boat, remember, full of people, but apparently there's room for a napper, right? And nappers always find room, right? You know, is he a sound sleeper? Is he exhausted? Or is this just an incredible picture that he has confidence in the Lord God Almighty? It may be all of those things. It may be all of those things. But this leads us to unexpected way number one that God works in our lives. Unexpected way number one, the Lord God Almighty guides us by his word into a storm, already knowing the outcome. The Lord God Almighty, he hung the stars in the galaxy. He makes the earth spin. He created all of humanity. That Lord God Almighty guides us by his word into a storm. And this account is a very clear picture of how he does that. And he already knows the outcome. He's not surprised by what happens 
when we experience a storm. There's two types of storms. One type of storm is a storm of correction. For example, if I'm sinning and I'm refusing to follow God and I'm refusing to obey him and my sin leads me to experience an incredible amount of significant consequences, I've created my own storm. And I'm, I'm receiving now a storm of consequences that's actually corrective by God's design because I have rebelled against him. Well, this storm's a different kind of storm. This is a storm of revelation. It's a storm that God creates for the purpose of revealing himself or revealing something about him, revealing his word, his person, his truth, a storm of revelation. In Luke chapter eight, verse 24, it says they went, so the disciples, they went and woke him, Jesus, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Master, they call him Master, Master. And they say, Master, Master, twice. And that two times of saying master, it shows the intimate relationship that they had with him. Master, master, we are perishing. Remember, of the 12 apostles, we know that some of them were actually professional fishermen, which means they were familiar with storms. They were familiar with this sea. They were familiar with the very boat that they were on. And yet true fear of death as the boat is compromised is taking them. And they're actually expecting to be destroyed. In Matthew's gospel, in 8.25, it says, and they went and woke him saying, save us, Lord, we're perishing. So here, Matthew's gospel, it, it calls him by the name Lord. So in Luke, Master, and in Matthew, Lord. Save us, Lord, we are perishing. This week, I was getting ready, and I was coming down the stairs um, to pick up, you know, to get my daughter and to take her to school. And as I'm coming down the stairs, she said, Daddy, Daddy, the wall. You know, I'm coming down the stairs. I'm like, yes, there's many in our house, many walls, right? What, what, are we, what are we talking about here, right? The wall, there it is. And she's pointing at the wall. There it is. It's there. Well, what's there? It's a bug. <laughs> All right. So I go to the wall, and I see that there's a spider on the wall. So I, you know, I do what dads do, right? I go get a napkin, right? I'm going to take care of this spider. And as I go to take care of the spider, she says, save me, daddy, save me. Save us, Lord, we're perishing. I wonder what God's perspective is when we find ourselves in these moments, when the disciples find themselves in this moment. And he's like, oh, my son is right with you. <laughs> my, my son's in the boat with you. Save us, Lord, we're perishing. There's a pretty incredible painting that Rembrandt did of this picture. And you, you can probably maybe look this up online a little bit later. You'll be able to see it better. Uh, it's, a really, really, it's a really beautiful painting. But it's of this very moment of the story where they're entreating Jesus and they're, and they're saying, Master, Lord, save us. In Isaiah 51, verse 9, it says, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, as in days of old, the generations of long ago. So there's, in Scripture, you know, it has this idea, you know, God's not asleep, okay? But in Scripture, it has this idea of, you know, awake, Lord, come help us, you know? Pay attention to us. It's not that we have to wake God up, but we're saying, awake, Lord, have your power be seen in this moment. Have your presence be seen in this moment. You know, do something, Lord. Save us, Lord. We're perishing. In Mark's gospel, we find out something really interesting about this moment in chapter four, verse 38. But he, Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Luke calls him master. Matthew calls him Lord. Mark calls him teacher. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? You ever felt like you've said something like that to the Lord? God, don't you care that I'm perishing? Lord, don't you care about what I'm experiencing right now? Lord, don't you care about the suffering that I'm going through right now? God, don't you care about my cancer? God, don't you care about my grief? God, don't you care about the broken heart that I have right now? God, don't you care about the depression that I'm in? God, don't you care about my anxiety and my worry? It's crippling, Lord. God, don't you care about my relationships, my broken relationships, my lack of relationships? God, don't you care about my loss, my job loss, my financial loss, my health loss, my family loss? 
God, don't you care? In Psalm 39, 3, it says, My heart became hot within me, and as I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. In other words, sometimes there's just moments where the words in us, they're like boiling fire. It's, just a, it's like an inferno. The words in us, they can't even stay in us. We just got to get them out to the Lord. Lord, don't you know what's going on? God, don't you know? Can't you see? In Isaiah 40, verse 27 and 28, it addresses this issue. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? That's like saying, God can't see me, my way is hidden from the Lord, God can't see me, or even worse, and my right is disregarded by my God, God sees me, but he set me aside. He sees me, but he's actually put me to side. It goes on with some incredible questions in verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. In other words, yes, he sees you. And yes, he knows everything that's going on in your life. And just because you're experiencing a circumstance that clouds that perspective of who God is and who he is and how he knows what's going on doesn't change who he is. And it doesn't change that he knows what's going on. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He's the everlasting God. He doesn't faint. He doesn't grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get into situations like the disciples in the boat and there's a water filling, I'm like, let's just get practical, right? Come on, everybody, let's go. Let's just get the water out. Anybody can relate? It's like you just want to fix the situation. Do I got any fellow fixers out there? Anybody who just likes to fix stuff? Like, let's just get the water out of the boat. Like, shouldn't that be our focus? Come on, let's just everybody help. In verse 24 in Luke chapter 8, it says, And he awoke. Jesus awakes and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was a calm. There's a resolution to the problem, but it is in a very unexpected way. No one in that boat is expecting Jesus to wake up and rebuke the wind, rebuke the raging waves. He's actually speaking to the natural elements. And the calm was immediate. In Matthew's gospel, chapter 8, 26, it says, Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. The Lord of creation rose and rebuked creation. And creation fell submissive and obedient to the Lord of creation. Here's a picture of what a boat on the Sea of Galilee when it's calm looks like. Same sea that we just watched from that storm. This storm would not have tapered off. It would have been abruptly ending at the word of the Lord, instantaneously still. In Mark's gospel, it helps us have some more detail. In 439, and he awoke and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. So from this gospel, which is why it's helpful to look at all of them together, this one helps us see what are the words he actually says. Peace be still. You know, the word of God calms a storm. The word of God can calm storms in our own lives. And in this moment, the water, smooth as glass. Perfect day to go water skiing. (laughs) Smooth as glass at the very word of God. Psalm 107, 28 and 29, which was written far before this account took place, is an incredible picture. Kind of amazing. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. 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 
a hush is so different than the storm. Sometimes he calms the storm. That's what happens in this account. Sometimes he calms the storm. Sometimes he does not calm the storm. Sometimes he calms his child in the storm. And it might be that you're going through a storm and God has not chosen to calm your storm. But God can calm you in the middle of the storm. And it might be that today is a day to receive the words of Jesus simply, peace be still. Peace be still. There is deliverance from trial, but there is also deliverance through trial. And we can be quick to ask God to remove the storms from our lives. But it's possible he doesn't want to remove the storm because he wants to give us peace, be still right in the middle of it. And this is unexpected way number two. God speaks his peace into our chaos. God speaks his peace, peace be still into the middle of our chaos, into the middle of our storms. I've asked Pastor Brandon to come and to minister to the church family during this time by singing a song. It's a song that the words are straight from this passage. During this song, I wanna encourage you to sit, uh, to consider whatever is going on in your life, and to receive uh, the scripture put to music that it would really minister to your heart during this time. Pastor Brandon.
in this moment in the boat, the master of the universe is in the boat. Yet they don't recognize him as the master of the universe yet. And so when he shows his mastery over the universe, they're totally surprised. In Luke chapter 8, verse 25, Jesus says to them, where is your faith? He said to them, where is your faith? He, he rebukes nature, peace be still. He rebukes nature with a command. But in this moment now, we see he rebukes his disciples with a question. And the question is, where is your faith? Where is your faith? In Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, we see the question phrased a little differently. He said to them, why are you so afraid? O oh, you of little faith. Why are you so afraid, O oh, you of, of little faith? That's like, that's like a statement. It's a question, but it's like a statement that says you should be more trusting. You should be more trusting. Insufficient faith. Why? Because their trust had been replaced by terror. And their faith suffered for fear. And it's amazing how terror and fear can steal our trust and our faith. In Mark chapter 4, verse 40, we get a little more blunt version of the question. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And, you know, Mark's gospel, when he writes, he's, he's heavily influenced by the apostle Peter. And if you read anything about the apostle Peter in the gospels, you see Peter's kind of a blunt guy. He kind of just gets right to the point. And I wonder about his influence on Mark in, in the way that this is here. And, you know, m maybe Peter says, hey, Mark, here's, here's really how it went down. Like, we had no faith. Like, we were in the boat, and we were totally afraid, and we had no faith. You know, we really got rebuked by Jesus on that day. <laughs> Why are you so afraid? Have you no faith, still no faith? You know, this is... One of the things I noticed with the disciples is like they take a few steps forward in faith and then they take a few steps back in faith. And it's like, okay, things are going good again. And it's like, oh, no, things aren't going so good, right? Can you relate to that? Hey, you know what? Things are okay. Yeah, Lord, all right. Oh, you know what? Oops, yeah, oh, huh, retreat. <laughs> it's like this back and forth. I mean, I really see the difference is on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes onto the followers of Jesus and then by the power of the Holy Spirit, once they're starting to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, it's like full faith, full forward, let's go. Man. But man, I can really understand that kind of back and forth. I can relate to that. And this is unexpected way number three, that God saves us by our faith in him. You know, we might expect, well, God's gonna save me because I work hard for him. And so I deserve to be saved. Or God's going to save me because, you know, I'm doing a bunch of good stuff. And so God's going to save me because I'm, I'm a good person. Or, you know, I'm really kind to people. Or I, I'm, I'm really sacrificial. Or I'm really working hard. Or I'm not doing a bunch of bad stuff. And so that's the reason God's going to save me. And those are none of the reasons that God says that he saves. He saves because he's good, not because we're good. And he saves as we place our faith in him, in his goodness, in his righteousness, not in our own. And that's a very unexpected way that God has decided to save us. That it would not be based on how good we are, but it would be based on how good he is. God saves us by our faith in him. In Luke chapter 8, verse 25, it says, And they were afraid. They were afraid. Why? Because when the holiness of God and his kingdom shows up in Holy Scripture every time, people are terrified when it happens. Whether it's an angel they see and they're very afraid, or whether it's an act of God that takes place and they're very afraid, because it is frightening to come into the presence of a holy God and to see his activity. It's terrifying. It says, and they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, who then is this? Who then is this that he commands even winds and water and they obey him? This made a huge impact on the disciples. They're marveling. You think about it. Wind and waves do not think. Wind and waves do not hear. 
Wind and waves do not make decisions. And yet in this account, we see wind and waves obeying the command of Jesus. It's incredible. It's amazing. The presence of something much more terrifying than the storm is with the disciples. And it's Jesus, the Son of God. And in this moment, they're recognizing, we thought the storm was scary. The Holy Son of God is here. You know, and I don't think they fully put it all together quite yet, but they're starting to get a clue. And they're starting to recognize it. Wow, and they're now very terrified about the presence of Jesus. In Matthew's Gospel, in 8.27, it says, And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even wind and waves and the sea obey him? In other words, they didn't even have a category to place Jesus in. They didn't even know how to categorize him. He's just so different. He stands alone. In Mark 4.41, it says, And they were filled with great fear, and they said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? In Luke chapter 9, verse 1, so, you know, just in the next chapter, we find that the 12, actually, the 12 apostles, they actually get authority over demons and diseases. But you know what they didn't have authority over? They didn't have authority to rebuke the wind. They didn't have authority to rebuke the waves. Jesus is in a category all by himself. There are no similars. There are no classmates. There are no equals. Jesus is other, he's different, he's higher, he's holy, and there's nothing more frightening than realizing I am in the presence of a holy God. Some people are called fearless in the face of danger, but all people will tremble before before a holy God. Every person trembles before a holy God. And the disciples were experiencing the presence of the holiness of God. In Proverbs 9, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So they say, who then is this? What sort of man is this? Well, this is the Son of God. This is the Lord. Which is why this passage forces us to make a decision on who do we think Jesus is. He commands, he rebukes the wind and the waves, and they obey him. Creation obeys him. So who is he? Who then is this? What sort of man is this? He is the Holy One, the Lord. He is the Son of God. And when we come in to recognize, what should our response be when we recognize that Jesus is the Holy One and he's the Lord and he's the Son of God? Well, our, our response should be that we would worship him. Because Every person, there is coming a moment where every person will come into the presence of a holy God because the Bible says that every knee is gonna bow before him and every every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We have no other response in the presence of a holy God than to be humbled. We, we, We can't actually do anything different than that. The only thing we can do in the presence of a holy God is to be humbled and to worship him for who he is. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So what I'd like to do to end our time of teaching is to give us an opportunity to humble ourselves. When we think about worship, sometimes we only equate worship to the time of singing And singing is included with worship, but singing is not everything that has to do with worship. Because another aspect of worship is just bowing before God and being humble before God and bowing before him and acknowledging him as the Holy One. And I'm gonna close 
in that way. And if you would like to bow before the Lord and to acknowledge him as the Holy One of God, I'd invite you to do so at this time as well. Father God, Lord, we recognize you are the Holy One. You are the Lord God Almighty. You are the Holy One. And Lord, we recognize the honor that you have bestowed on your Son, Jesus Christ. You have set him over all. You've given him authority over all. He reigns supreme over all. And we acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Holy One of God, the Holy Son of God. We recognize Jesus Christ as the one who is the Holy Word of God. And Lord, right now, we have no other response other than to be humbled. We have nothing else we can do other than being humbled, be humbled before you. And so we worship you. We worship you, God. We worship Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the Lord Almighty. And we pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's family said, amen. amen.